Bibles this morning and open to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3, we're in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, and we're in a series entitled, When God Seems Unfair. When God Seems Unfair. And let me just go ahead and tell you, uh, God is not fair. Did you know that? You might think that God should be fair, but God's not fair. And I want you to know this morning, you don't want God to be fair. Because when things are fair, you get what you deserve. And you don't want God to give you what you deserve. Now, God is loving, and God is merciful, and God is gracious, and God is kind. But God is also just, and righteous, and pure, and holy. And there are times in our lives when we walk through difficulties and challenges, and we look around, and we see life falling apart, and we think, God, this is just not right. The wicked seem to prosper. The righteous seem to suffer. Bad people are getting ahead, and good people are falling behind, and this just doesn't seem right. And so sometimes we might look up to the heavens and say, God, it doesn't even seem like you're fair, but when you think that, when you feel that, or maybe when you say that, you just need to remember, you don't, God, you don't want God to be fair with you. You want him to be merciful to you. You want him to show you his grace and his love. Habakkuk is in a situation probably where you've been and where I've been before. He's facing a crisis. He's facing a difficulty. He's encountering a, a tough situation, and he does not know what to do. He looks around, and he sees all these problems that are mounting up against him, one thing after another after another. You ever been there before? And life seems to be falling apart. But today, I want to talk to you about this subject from Habakkuk chapter 3, the answer for all of life's problems. The answer for all of life's problems. Stephanie and I have been married for 11 years. 11 years, and that seems like a long time for us. 11 years together, 11 of the best years of my life, 11 perfect, wonderful, absolutely amazing years. Right, darling? You see her nodding her head. I told you it's true. 11 years, and then I hear of people that have been married 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And we've, we've recognized folks on Sunday morning sometimes married 60 years, 65 years or more, that just blows me away. And you know, you talk to a couple that's been married that long, and what they'll tell you is this, we've been together for so long, it's not that we never had any problems, it's not that we never faced any issues, we just learned how to weather the storm together. Even when you've been married 11 years, what you learn is, you learn how to work together to overcome problems and issues, because there's no marriage here that doesn't face storms and problems. There's no person here that doesn't face issues and troubles. There's no Christian that doesn't face a crisis at one time or another of one type or another. We all face problems. The, the issue is not, will you face a crisis, but how do you respond when the crisis comes? I'll give you an example. Men and women have a completely different language. We speak different languages. We say the same words, but we do not mean the same thing. Let me give you an example. When I say, I just don't have anything to wear, that means all the clothes are dirty. They're either in the washer or the dryer, and there's nothing in my drawers to wear. When Stephanie says, I just don't have anything to wear, she means I've looked through the millions of outfits in my closet, and all the shoes that I have piled up in the floor, and all the things in the laundry room. I've looked everywhere and there's nothing that I would like to wear. You, you get how that, that's different, right? Men, I hope that you understand that's different, okay? Also, there's, a, there's, there's another one. Here's, here's one. I need to get dressed. If Stephanie looks at me and says, sweetheart, you need, you need to get dressed. And I look and I'm like, I've got gym shorts and a ripped t-shirt on. I am dressed. I'm good to go. But when Stephanie says she needs to get dressed, it involves the shower and the blow drying the hair and the makeup and the outfit and everything, right? Right? That, that's same words, different language. Here's another one. <laughs> Is this shirt clean? What does that mean? Because to her, is the shirt clean means, did it come right out of the dryer? Does it smell good? Is it nice? And is this what you're going to wear? To me, if it's not standing up right in the corner all by itself, it's okay. You know, you can wear that. That's all right. You know, here, here's another one. Are the kids ready? 
Are the kids ready? Does that mean like are they breathing? Are they moving? Are they conscious? Okay, because yes, they're ready to go. No, are they ready? So I have just learned, men, here's a great thing you need to learn. You smile and nod. Smile and nod. All right? You got that? You just need to say, yes, dear, whatever you say, darling. I'm telling you, that saves a lot of problems and issues in your marriage. If you've been married for any time, any amount of time, you know that you're going to face struggles and hardships. And the issue is not, will a problem come? The issue is, how do you survive the storm? And this is what Habakkuk is facing. Habakkuk's looking out at the enemy. Now, these are the Chaldeans coming against the people of God. The Chaldeans, they were supposed to help the people of God. They were supposed to protect the people of God. They were supposed to protect them against the Babylonians. But now, the very people that they've been depending on have turned on them. And Habakkuk looks out and he's very concerned. In Habakkuk chapter 1, we see the storm brings hurt. In Habakkuk chapter 2, we see that God brings healing. In Habakkuk chapter 3, we see that God sends hope in the midst of the storm from hurt to healing to hope. Habakkuk has learned not, not how to avoid the storm, not how to complain or to whine in the midst of the storm. We've got that down. But Habakkuk has learned how to stand and survive through the midst of the storm. Read with me Habakkuk chapter 3. And we'll read the entire chapter, verses 1 to 19. Some of the most beautiful portions of Scripture right here in this text. Habakkuk chapter 3, begin reading in verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light rays flashed from His hand. There He veiled His power. Before Him went pestilence and plague followed at His heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction, the curtains of Midian, of the land of Midian did terrible. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea when you rode on your horses and on your chariots of salvation? You stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging rivers, waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped. As the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people. For the salvation of your anointed You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the head of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet... I will quietly wait for the Lord. I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive leaf fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy. And the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. To the choir master with stringed instruments. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. And now, we pray the Spirit of God would add illumination to the preaching and the teaching and the reading of your word. Take your truth and speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Habakkuk chapter 3 is actually one of the most powerful sections of Scripture in the entire Bible. It is one of the most passionate and one of the most emotion-packed sections of Scripture that you will find anywhere. Habakkuk chapter 3, and there are many people in this place like this. Habakkuk is in the midst of a crisis. 
If you're here today and you'd say, I've never been in a crisis. There's never been an issue or a problem in my life. If you're like that, you just hang on because you'll join the rest of us one day. You will face struggles, heartache, and crisis. Habakkuk's in the midst of a crisis. And what happens in Habakkuk chapter 3 is incredibly significant. Habakkuk is whining in chapter 1. He's complaining about what he sees. Then in chapter 2, he decides, I'm no longer going to whine. Chapter 2, he hears the voice of God and God speaks to him. And in chapter 3, Habakkuk learns. He learns what God does in the midst of a crisis and in the midst of the storm. And in Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk decides to praise God. It's not because everything got better. It's not because the enemies were defeated. It's not because the storm went away. He chose to praise God in the midst of the mess, in the moment of the storm. And Habakkuk chapter 3 is an incredibly passionate, powerful praise from a prophet. We know this because of a very interesting word there in verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigianoth. You might want to circle that word in your Bible. That is the only place that word appears anywhere in Scripture. Shigianoth. The only place it appears anywhere in Scripture, Psalm 7 has it as an inscription from David, a Shigianah. But the only place you'll find this verse within the text of Scripture is Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 1. According to Shigianoth, Shigianoth is a musical notation. It seems as if Habakkuk is singing or praising. Shigianoth is a song with a deep, guttural beat. The song beats strong. It it gives the idea of deep passion and deep emotion. You won't find that word anywhere else. And Habakkuk is saying, God, even in the midst of the mess, I am going to sing praise to you. I'm going to give you the honor and the glory that you deserve. This is not just the choir rehearsal. This is not just a praise song. This is a song with a pulse, with a beat, with passion. Literally, the word means this. Are you ready? Literally, the word means my scream song. My scream song. In the midst of the mess, he's crying out, Oh, God, would you deliver me? Now, maybe you don't know what a scream song is, so I've asked Pastor Gary if he'd come and lead us in a scream song this morning. You ready? He would be the best at leading a scream song, don't you think? (laughs) Just kidding. Habakkuk is crying out to God. In the midst of all the problems, they're still there. But he's depending on the goodness and the faithfulness of the Lord. See, when we arrive to Habakkuk chapter 3, Habakkuk has learned. He's learned to praise God even in the midst of the storm. He's learned to give God glory even in the midst of the mess. And so in the midst of the crisis, in the middle of the crisis, it's not enough just to make it through. It's not enough to just survive. You want to thrive. And you want to give God glory. Three ways right here in the text of Habakkuk chapter 3. Number one. When you're in the midst of the storm, rely on the promise and purpose of God. Rely on the promise and purpose of God. We find this in the first seven verses of the chapter. In the midst of the storm, rely on God's promise and God's purpose. Believe that God is going to bring you victory, but trust in Jesus Christ. You see, in the midst of the mess, you have to have faith that God is on his throne and he knows what he's doing. You have to have faith that God is smarter than you and he's got it under control. You have to believe and to trust that God has it handled. You see, Habakkuk is trusting in the Lord. And I want you to notice something very interesting. Habakkuk is trusting in the Lord. He's depending on God even while the storm rages around him. Habakkuk still cries out to God even as the nations rage. Even as the Chaldeans are at the gate. Even as destruction seems imminent. Habakkuk praises God. He's relying on the promise and the provision of God in the midst of the storm. He's relying on his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's relying on the promise that great is thy faithfulness. God will be good. You see, some of you, some of you place your faith in things instead of in Christ. Some of you place your faith in a bank account. And when the bank account doesn't say what it needs to say, you think life is falling apart and you don't know what to do. Some of you place your faith in a relationship and the relationship fractures or when your family falls apart, your faith and trust has been in that relationship and when it falls apart, you don't know what to do. Some of you place your faith in your job or your career and when that crumbles from underneath you, you have no idea what to do. Listen, 
All the things that life has to offer and all the things that you can gain in this world cannot compare to the faithfulness, the goodness, the peace, and the provision of Almighty God. Nothing this world brings can attain anywhere close to the faithfulness and goodness, the power and the might of Almighty God. You see, we place our faith in so many things of this world. So I, I believe George Washington existed. I've read the history books. I believe that Abraham Lincoln existed. I, 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 believe, uh, I, I believe in all sorts of historical events and facts, but I only trust in Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't trust in the things of this world. If we place our hope and trust in the things of this world, count on it, you will be disappointed. You'll be disappointed. But trust in Christ. Rely on His promise. Rely on His purpose. Rely on the promise and the purpose of God in the midst of the mess. Some of you in this room, you're in the midst of the storm and you're praying for victory. And if God doesn't come through and grant you victory, it will harm your faith in Him. You're not trusting in Jesus, you're trusting in victory. What you need to make sure to do is in the midst of the crisis and the problems that you're experiencing, don't trust in victory. Trust in God. Trust in a God who has the power to grant you the victory. Rest and rely on His purpose and His promise. Look at what Habakkuk says in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. You see what Habakkuk is saying? Now you need to understand the context. Remember, the Babylonians are coming against the people of God. The Chaldeans have been recruited to help the people of God. They will help bring the victory. And all of a sudden, those that are supposed to help are against them. And Habakkuk looks out and sees no way out of this. There, there's no way we can survive. Not just the Babylonians, but the Chaldeans, those that we trusted are against us. And he is afraid. But what does he say in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 2? He doesn't say, I'm looking at my circumstances in fear. He's saying, oh Lord, I've heard the report of you and your work. And oh Lord, I fear. God, all of these things around me in my life and all of these issues that we're facing, all the problems that I'm experiencing, I don't fear those things. I fear and trust in you, his relationship with God was more important than anything else. It's interesting to watch my children's reactions when I return home from a long trip. It's very interesting because each child is different. No matter how many kids you have, every child is different. You may have uh, one child, two children, three, four. We have five. Every one of them, every one of them seems to be just complete opposites. I don't know how you can have five opposites, but it's true. They're just so different. And so when I come home from a long trip, it's interesting for me to watch my children's reactions when I arrive, especially if I've been out of the country, because I have a habit. If, if I'm going out of the country, Brazil or Mexico or uh, other places, I will, uh, I'll bring something home for them. Not anything really big, typically a t-shirt, maybe uh, a necklace for the girls or something like that. And, and, and when I walk in the door after being gone for some time, typically I get one of two reactions. Daddy's home. That's always my, one of my favorites, you know, daddy's home. There's one question. Daddy's home. What'd you bring me? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And the first question they're interested in, the first thing that they want to know is, what did daddy bring? What can daddy give us? But there's another one that's my favorite. It's my favorite when the kids say, daddy's home. I missed you so much while you were away. Now, I'm telling you, as a father a child. I love to hear the children who recognize the relationship. It's not about what daddy brings in his hands when he arrives. It's about daddy. You understand what I'm saying? And a lot of us in the midst of the mess and the problems and storms of life that we face, when we cry out to God, we're saying, God, I'm here. God, I know you're here. What did you bring me? What do you have to give me? God, I need something. And God is saying to us, you don't understand. You don't recognize that the greatest gift that you can have in the midst of the storm is me. It's not what I bring to you. It is who I am. And some of you here are asking God to provide for you. And God is saying, I've given you the greatest provision. The Holy Spirit of God that dwells in you. Some of you trust in God because what he can give you. Trust in God for who he is. I want you to know through pain. 
through pain, God either has a promise or a purpose. He either brings a promise that he'll take the pain away or a purpose that he will make you more like his son, Jesus Christ. I want to say that again because that's powerful. It's worth the price of admission, okay? Through pain, God either has a promise or a purpose. He gives you a promise that he will take the pain away or he gives you the purpose. Through the pain, he will make you more like him. So when we walk through the pain, the heartache of life, believe it or not, walking through the pain and the heartache of life, trusting in God, you can't lose. He'll either work a miracle in your life or he'll make you more like Jesus or he'll take you home. Number one, rely on the promise and purpose of God. Number two, rest in the peace and provision of hope. Rest in the peace and provision of hope. We are promised eternal life. We're promised a home in heaven one day. But what about this mess on earth? Did God promise us eternal life and miserable existence? Did God promise us eternal life one day in heaven and problems abounding on this earth? Now I want you to know, he says, in this world you will have trouble. Yes, he says, there's going to be pain and trouble and storms. But in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the storms, what did he say? Peace I give you. Not peace like the world gives. But my peace I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. We need to learn not to be troubled in trouble. We need to learn our hearts, our lives, our minds, our attitudes. We need to learn to focus on him through the midst of it all. And here in this text, Habakkuk looks out and he sees all the mess around him. But what does he do? He leans on the hope that God has given him. Now, right here in this section, Habakkuk chapter 3, and specifically these verses 8 to 15, Habakkuk is reminding us and reminding the people, and he's pronouncing as he sings that God is a God who's in control of everything. God is a God who's in control of nature. All the earth bows down before him. Look at what he talks about. Verse 8, he talks about the rivers and the sea. Verse 10, he talks about the mountains and the waters and the deep. Verse 11, he talks about the sun and the moon. Verse 12, he talks about the earth. Verse 15, he talks about the sea and the waters. What is he saying? He's saying the God that made everything, the God that's in control of everything, is the same God that's in control of this circumstance and situation. He's got it under control. He's in charge. If God can keep the earth spinning on its axis and revolving around the sun, God is can handle your problem. He's got this. He has it under control. You know how I know Habakkuk is recognizing this? There's a word he uses three times in Habakkuk chapter 3. A word that's not anywhere else in Scripture beside the Psalms. This word exists 71 times in the book of Psalms, three times in Habakkuk. Nowhere else in Scripture, the word Selah. Selah. You see that word three times. We see it right there at the end of verse 3. We see it at the end of verse 9. We see it at the end of verse 13. The word is a musical notation. And in music, it means let the instruments rest. So we've been, Habakkuk's been singing his song. Then he says, Selah. Take a break. Let the instruments rest. Musically, that's what it means. But spiritually, it means something so significant. Habakkuk's heart within him is in turmoil. He sees the problems, the heartache, and the pain. He's in the midst of a mess, and he cries out to God. And in the midst of crying out to God, he says, Selah. Spiritually speaking, what it means is, take a rest. Rest in God. Trust in Him. Rely on the peace and provision that he brings, and the hope that he offers. What it means is this. Remember that God is in control. There's nothing you face that he cannot handle, and there's nothing you face where he does not care. Selah. Take a rest. Listen to me. In the midst of the mess, God is right there. This does not happen much at our home. Some of you have kids that sleep with you every single night. I don't know how you get one wink of sleep. It is impossible. It doesn't happen much at our home, but when Jake was a little boy, Jake had a bad dream one night. And he crawled into our bed. We have a king-size bed. We have a king-size bed. And so we have plenty of room for Jake to sleep right there in the middle between me and Stephanie. But Jake decided instead of sleeping the right way, horizontally on the bed, he wanted to sleep vertically all the way across, you know. And the whole night, here I am on my side, and here he is in the middle. Here's Stephanie's on the other side. And the whole night, I'm 
flipping him back and putting him in the right place because I've got a knee in my back or a head in my, my leg, and it's just crazy. And, and then as I, as I put him back the right way, I lay back down in my spot, put him in the middle, and all of a sudden, I couldn't go to sleep because he just kept pushing up against me closer and closer. And uh, some of you can, can be snuggle sleepers, and that's fine. I'm not a snuggle sleeper, okay? I need some space to be able to sleep, all right? If you're married, hey, if you're married, be a snuggle sleeper. That's good for you. Congratulations. God bless you. But I need some space when it's time to sleep, all right? And so every time Jake would scoot a little closer to me, I'd scoot a little closer to the edge. And every time he'd scoot a little closer to me, I'd scoot a little closer to the edge. And every time I scooted closer to the edge, he scooted closer to me. And I couldn't go any farther. I was about to fall off the bed. And I woke up that morning. Well, I can't say woke up because I never really went back to sleep. But I got up that morning and I thought, Lord, please never give my son a bad dream ever, ever again. You know what Jake wanted? In the midst of his fear, in the midst of the problem, you know what he wanted? He wanted my presence. He wanted to know, Dad's right there. And so every time I moved away, what do you do? He moved closer. Because he wanted to feel my presence. I want you to hear me today. Listen, listen. It is in a crisis. It is in pain. It is in heartache. When you can literally reach out and touch him. Draw close to him. Crawl up in his lap. Feel his presence. He gives you the peace and the provision that hope offers in the midst of the mess. Rely on the promise and purpose of God. Rest in the peace and provision of hope. And number three, we see right here in verses 16 to 19. Rise above the problems and pain of life. Rise above the problems and pain of life. Life is full of problems and pain. But it's also full of many people rising above the problems and pain. Helen Keller once said, yes, the world is full of suffering. But the world is also full of people overcoming suffering. You will face a crisis. You'll have a hard time. You'll have struggles and issues. Rise above it. Habakkuk is saying in verses 16 to 19, part of the most beautiful section of this chapter, even though I am weak and weary in my flesh, even though my flesh is hurting my spirit sores, even though I'm crushed down by my circumstances, spiritually speaking, I'm trusting and resting in God. How do we know this? Well, there's a significant phrase in verse 16 and in verse 18. You might want to circle this phrase in your Bible. He talks about how he hears the pain, the problems that are coming. Then he says, yet I will. Yet I will. He's saying, my knees are shaking, I'm trembling, I'm worried, I'm scared. Verse 16, yet I will. Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. In the midst of all of it, he says, yet I will. Selah, relax. Don't stress. Trust in God. Shigianoth means to praise out loud. It is a visceral, guttural cry to God. God help me. And here, pray. Verse 3, right there, public, praising God. Let's read verses 17 to 19 as we remember how Habakkuk praises the Lord in the midst of the mess. Here's what he says. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me to tread on high places. Do you see how Habakkuk is praising God? Notice this now. How does the verse 17 begin? Though. We need to praise even though everything's not yet right. He says, though the fig tree doesn't blossom. I don't see any blossoms on the fig tree. Look what it says. Though there's no fruit on the vine. Though the produce of the olive fails. Though the field is yielding no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold. Though there be no herd in the stalls. Even though everything is falling apart. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will praise Him. He doesn't say, and this is how we praise, when. When there's a flock in the stall. When there's fruit on the vine. When there's a blossom on the tree. 
When I experience joy, when victory comes, then I will praise. No, you need to learn to cry out to God in the midst of the storm and say, even though life is falling apart, I will rejoice in God. We've got to learn that. We've got to rise above the problems and the pain of life. Everyone in this room has been through a crisis. Everyone here has a scar that tells a story. But you want to know something interesting? The scar is proof that you came out on the other side. The scar is proof that the problem didn't kill you and that God is good and faithful. In the midst of the crisis, when your strength rises, when your faith becomes stronger, when your wisdom becomes deeper, don't run from the problem. Stand in the midst of the pain and ask God to give you strength to endure. Rise above the problems and the pain of life. You see, God has a word for you. Sometimes you may just need to get up close and feel his presence. Don't be scared. He's right there. You know, one of God's purposes for your life. God's purpose is to give you the capacity to praise him and rejoice in him. To praise him loudly, deeply, passionately, even when the storm rages around you. You know that? And you'll never know how to do it if you never face a storm. You will never know how to praise God in the midst of a problem if you live a problem-free life. You will never know how God can solve problems if you never have any for Him to solve. I want you to notice something very interesting. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. Such a powerful verse of Scripture. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is saying nothing that comes our way, all the problems and pain of life, nothing that comes your way will be able to separate you from the love of God. Back at chapter 3 and verse 2, look at what he says. This is a prayer now. Lord, I've heard the report of you, I fear heard the report of you and your work in the midst of the years God revive it revive your work in the midst of the years make it known here's the phrase in wrath remember mercy do you hear what he's saying in wrath remember mercy Habakkuk is saying, in the midst of judgment, in the midst of a crisis, in the midst of the problem, God, would you show yourself strong in mercy? And I want you to know something. You read every book of the Bible, read every judgment of God, read every time that God allows His people to be judged. Even in the midst of judgment, God brings mercy. Even in wrath, God is merciful. If you want proof, here it is. If you want proof that in wrath, God remembers mercy, there's one place you look. Look to the cross. Look to the cross where there upon Jesus Christ God poured out all of His wrath and judgment against sin. Where there upon Jesus Christ God poured out completely everything that was due to you and me. Everything that we deserved as a result of our sin. All the punishment that we deserved was on Christ. In wrath, but through Christ, God opened the gates of mercy. Even as Christ is bearing up under the weight of the wrath of God, the mercy and the grace, the forgiveness, the redemption, salvation begins to flow because God is a God who even in the midst of judgment shows himself merciful. Hey, church, he deserves to be praised today. Amen. Even in the midst of wrath, God remembers mercy. He poured out his wrath on Christ so that he might shower you with mercy and blessing.